Well, happy Christmas, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here in this transition period, this, um, the night before a new year begins. The year's ending and a new one's beginning, and it's a, it is a funny time, this transition. I think it's a time of introspection at the end of the Christmas holiday. Um, it's a time for sort of taking stock, maybe a bit daunting, uh, we try not to think too far ahead at this moment. Um, but if ever there's a time for, for consolation, I think um, this is it. And the story of Simeon um, that we have, Simeon with the dedication of Jesus at the temple, is, is a perfect fit, I think, for this time of year. So I'm just going to try and read the story for us. Um, and it's found in Luke chapter 2, and verses, I'll try and read from verses 22 to 35. Then it was the, oh, I'm going to 23, actually. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So, when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace, as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people, he is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, and many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. So, what a wonderful story. It's a story of dedication. Um, something new is happening. And one of the joys of reading the Bible, uh, as a set of 66 books involving very different types of literature, is that you begin to see interrelations, interrelated passages, a sort of the integrated nature of the whole narrative. Um, we know that in Timothy, uh, Paul reminds us that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And, and different biblical books cover material in different ways, Many are not meant to be read as history, uh, but here we have Luke, he's a trained historian, and he's been investigating and uh, eyewitness accounts about Jesus from the beginning, and laying out an accurate account, he tells us, so that some influential patron called Theophilus might know the truth of what had been taught. Now... I'm going to see if this works. Where do I point it? Do I point it that way? Hmm. No, it's, worked. it's worked. Okay. So writers of biblical books often write in a much more condensed way than modern people are used to. Um, ancient authors often reference in well-crafted sentences previous biblical texts. It's a little bit like computer hyperlinks so that the phrase that's in the book we're studying links to phrases from earlier biblical works. And, and these hyperlinks trigger in your mind 
echoes of previous stories that enrich the meaning um, of, of the biblical narrative. This uh, fantastic uh, piece of art, I don't know if every, any of you have seen this, but this is actually from the infographic Bible. And I'll, uh, I've, I've brought a copy of the infographic Bible just to show you. And it has uh, wonderful pictures in it um, that illustrate some of the themes of, of, of the biblical text. This one is showing you the references where biblical verses from Genesis through to Revelation refer to other verses in the Bible. Okay? So there are 63,397 times that one verse in the Bible refers to another verse somewhere else in the Bible. And um, that's really exciting. <laughs> Because that means that the more you study the Bible, the more interconnections you will see and the richer the meaning of the passage you're studying will become. So I'm going to try and look at this uh, in Luke's story of the encounter with Simeon. Now in the words Luke uses, he echoes other parts of the Bible. And I'm going to try and show you, you how. Simeon is a righteous and devout man, and he's awaiting the Messiah. He's awaiting what is in the text is called the consolation of Israel. So what is the consolation of Israel? And, and why is he waiting for a person called the Messiah? So I'm going to just show you another image from this infographic Bible. And this one shows the recorded instances when God spoke to people himself or through the prophets. From Genesis onwards through to the prophets, you can see um, a, a burst with the prophets, then a gap, and then finally the New Testament gospel accounts. So from about 760 BC, the dark black begins with Amos, Hosea, Isaiah. And then Assyria destroys Israel and onwards through Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel. Finally exiled, the Jews are exiled into Babylon. There's a cacophony of, of prophetic noise and even when the exiles returned to Jerusalem, God was speaking to Ezra, and Nehemiah, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi, and then stops. From about 490 BC onwards, there seems to be silence. 70 times seven years of waiting. And as they waited, the Israelites are rebuilding the second temple under the Persian Empire. Then Alexander the Great comes through and conquers in 333 BC. A whole load of Greek estates, royal estates, are set up. And it was in this period that the Maccabees, some pious Jews, actually managed to get Israel independent for a short time before, in 63 BC, they're overrun by the Romans. And it was during that period of silence that messianic expectation built up. The prophets had foretold the coming Messiah, and yet there now seems to be a wait, a period of waiting. So there are at least about 103 different prophecies of a Messiah in the Bible, but I'll just read one, Daniel 9, verse 24. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. Now listen and understand, 70 sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. 
So the idea of a Messiah king is, is, is in many of these prophetic passages, and it also in a whole host of other prophetic passages that were in intertestamental literature that hasn't made it into the Bible. Books like Enoch 46, which talks about this son of man whom you have seen will raise up the kings and the mighty from their seats, and so on. But perhaps it's in the prophets, in the older prophets, such as Isaiah, and particularly chapters 40 to 66, that the messianic prophecies come most abundantly, talking about a suffering servant of the Lord, the Lord's anointed one. And that section in Isaiah, chapters 40 through to 66, is often termed the consolation of Israel. It's 26 chapters talking about the Lord's servant who was to come. So this description of Simeon waiting in the temple for the Messiah and the consolation of Israel, when it's described in that way, it immediately refers the reader to that chap those chapters in Isaiah, chapters 43 to 66. They're fantastic chapters. Perhaps if you've got the time, just read through the whole lot from 40 to 66. Um, but they begin, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. The silence has finally been broken. And as Simeon holds the promised Messiah, God's salvation in his arms, Isaiah 7 foretold it, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin, young woman, will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And Simeon's words really closely match bits of Isaiah. So Isaiah 49, when we read in verse 6, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me, I will make you a light to the Gentiles, and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So as Simeon is pronouncing these words over Jesus, he's echoing a whole body of prophetic literature in Isaiah that foretells the coming of the Messiah. But let's not jump ahead Let's, the story starts with a description of this act of dedication. The parents were bringing the child Jesus to, to the temple to do for him what the custom of the law required. So what is it that they were doing at the temple, Mary and Joseph? The answer is that they were dedicating their firstborn child as required by Exodus 13 and Numbers 18. And the reader who knows the biblical story, when, when Luke describes it in this way, they will immediately think back, yes, this is dedication. This is all about the Exodus. It's about the day God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. They were to remember that God had been supreme over Pharaoh, the firstborn son of the deity Ra in Egyptian theology, and God had shown his supremacy by taking the Egyptian firstborns, by killing the Egyptian firstborn children, but sparing those who believed in Israel's God and showed that by daubing blood of a lamb over the doorpost. And that lamb, as we heard in uh, Sam's excellent expositions, uh, that, that lamb was abhorrent to the Egyptians. They, they, they didn't like uh, cattle and sheep, and they were abhorrent to them. So that was a sign of Israel daubing the blood on the, on the doorposts, and God proved real and sovereign. And because of that, um, the, the, the Israelites and Simeon uh, at the temple is, is, 
in part of this process of dedicating the firstborn child. So because of that exodus, the Israelites all dedicated their firstborn children. The memorial sweeps us back in time to the eve of that great exodus when God rescued his people from the darkness of slavery through that final plague. The death of any firstborn sons in households not marked with the lamb's blood. The lambs are slain and the son, that the sons of Israel might live. And so God rescues his people and takes them to freedom to the very land where Simeon now stands, and Jesus, the Lamb of God, is being dedicated, echoing that great rescue mission. But the dedication of the firstborn son also echoes an even older story. Do you remember the second of these stories? You can see it at the bottom here. It's Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, the father of Israel, was asked by God to sacrifice his only son Isaac on Mount Moriah, the very mountain on which Solomon's temple will ultimately be built in Jerusalem. So he is to sacrifice the very child through whom the promise of descendants were going to form a great nation. And when, in faith, Abraham went to sacrifice his son, God stepped in to provide the sacrifice, a ram in a thicket. And so Abraham named Mount Moriah Yahweh Yira, or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And so, as Simeon holds Jesus, the firstborn son of God himself, on Mount Moriah, named by Abraham, the Lord will provide. The Lord has indeed provided. He's provided once and for all a sacrifice for our sin in the person of Jesus. So you can see there are echoes of these earlier stories that are being alluded to by, by Luke. And why is this dedication and sacrifice needed? For that, we need to go back still further to Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And the firstborn, Adam and Eve, are hiding in a garden, having eaten from the fig tree, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And feeling shame at their nakedness, they sew fig leaves together as the Lord God walks in the garden to find them walking in the garden, perhaps, as the man who would one day reconcile mankind to God. So as Simeon raises up Jesus, there are echoes even of Adam. And the echo is picked up elsewhere in, in Romans. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, Paul says, who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and the gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. So as Simeon is testifying both that Jesus is God's salvation and that Jesus is sent as a sign from God and will be opposed. The deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce Mary's very soul. So that image of a sword actually echoes another verse in Isaiah 49, where in the opening verses we read, the Lord called me before my birth, from within the womb he called me by name, he made my words of judgment as sharp as a sword. And so Simeon is ushering in God's consolation for Israel. There's a sense of comfort, but there's also a sense of very real suffering and pain to come. And that's found in the echoes from the past. The Christian life is not about freedom from suffering. It's a call to follow our Messiah 
into suffering, to follow our Messiah in suffering with and for others. So let's return to how Simeon's song picks up some of the themes of the suffering servant from the prophet Isaiah. First, there's the notion of salvation itself. Simeon says, For my eyes have seen your salvation. And this carries an echo from Isaiah 52, which predicts that salvation. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. The watchmen shout and sing with joy, for before their very eyes, they see the Lord returning to Jerusalem. Let the ruins of Jerusalem break into joyful song, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. And Simeon goes on to note that the salvation which you have prepared is in the sight of all nations. This opening up of salvation to all nations echoes Isaiah 52 further down in verse 10, where it says, The Lord has demonstrated his holy power before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth will see the victory of our God. But of course, these passages of salvation then lead on in Isaiah into the passages of suffering that it's not going to be a victorious Messiah, King, triumphant. It's going to be a suffering servant. In Isaiah 53, we read, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sin of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, Yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. So Simeon's words call the reader's mind to these passages called the consolation of Israel. And they're passages of a suffering servant, the lamb led to the slaughter, Lambs, blood on doorposts, rams in thickets given for our redemption, echoes and echoes of this eternal comfort. And perhaps in this dark season, like Simeon, we're awaiting consolation. And, and in Jesus, we do find consolation. He died for our sins. He established a kingdom long foretold. It really is a kingdom long foretold. Um, do you remember many years after Isaiah, um, when the Israelites were in exile in Babylon, and Daniel was interpreting ne Nebuchadnezzar's dream about a huge statue that had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of bronze, legs of iron, feet of clay, smashed by a rock hewn from, from the mountain. And Daniel explains the dream to Nebuchadnezzar that each layer of the statue is a kingdom, each inferior to those before. The last of iron and clay we take to be Rome. And here we are in Rome with Simeon, 
Daniel is concluding, during the reign of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It'll crush all those kingdoms into nothingness, and it'll stand forever. So our consolation is that this kingdom is at hand. It's established by Jesus, and yet it's still being worked out. So while we know the future is secure, for now, we have to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And how does the kingdom come? It comes as we pick up our crosses and follow our suffering servant Messiah. So our consolation is real But it's also very painful. It's not a comfortable faith we hold. Just as Mary was told that a source will pierce her very soul, so we're warned by Jesus, here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows. But there's good news in that same paragraph because Jesus goes on to say, take heart because I have overcome the world. And in that same speech after the Lord's Supper at Passover, Jesus promises the disciples, I'll ask my Father and he'll give you another comforter who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So perhaps um, I wanted to just conclude this um, talk about the consolation of Israel, the comfort by focusing in, finally, on the comforter who is part of that story of Simeon, the Holy Spirit. Of Simeon, we are told, the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Now, before Simeon's time, being moved by the Spirit was a relatively rare thing. But in our age, the comfort, the comforter, is with every believer. As Simeon lifted Jesus in song, he carried in his arms the very comforter who would first live with his disciples, but later in them through the Holy Spirit. So this is our hope and our reality. Uh, Jesus is alive, and the Holy Spirit lives in us. It sort of began in that picture on the right, um, 50 days after the Passover and crucifixion, following Jesus' resurrection at the festival of Pentecost. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. That Holy Spirit is also with us, leading us into all truth. So as we face this new year, awaiting our consolation, let's brave together its likely trials and sorrows. Let's try to pick up our cross and follow our Savior, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles. And that's us, by the way. Um, Let's walk with those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are humble, who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. And let's remember Simeon and, like him, be filled with the Holy Spirit, our comforter and strength. So that when we too have finally run life's race, we can say, like Simeon, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Amen. Maybe we should just finish with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this inspiring story of Simeon.
that as he lifted Jesus in that ceremony of dedication at the temple, he echoed all the many stories from Adam through Abraham right through to the Exodus and then to Jesus himself. Lord, we thank you that you have always intended our consolation and that in Jesus you have set us free to serve you. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us all with your Holy Spirit so that we might, through the indwelling of the Comforter, be a comfort to those around us and in the year ahead. In Jesus' name.